Please open your Bibles to uh, Acts chapter 12. We'll finish that this morning and then get on into chapter 13. We'll start at verse 19 just to pick up the previous verse's thoughts and then get on into the remaining part of the, the chapter um, and finish that up this morning and we'll see what we find in chapter 13. Let's have a word of prayer as we begin our class this morning. Father, we're thankful for another day that you've blessed us with. We're thankful for the privilege and opportunity we have to gather here now and study from thy word. We're thankful it's a day of worship. We can gather and praise and glorify thee and edify one another. We pray, Father, that you'll be with us today and we'll do those things that are according to your will, that are pleasing in your sight, that uh, we might continue to do those things that are according to your will and walk in a way that would bring our and glory to your name. We're mindful this morning, Father, of the loss of David Robinson. We're thankful for his life. We're thankful for the example he set for his family and friends and for his brothers and sisters in Christ. And we pray, Father, that we will continue to honor him as we go about our lives, uh, as we comfort his family, help us to be what we need to be, help us to be instruments in your hand uh, for so many things and help us to find the time and have the desire to do the things that would be an extension of yourselves through us. We pray, Father, that you'll bless this congregation, help us with the difficulties that we face. Uh, we realize that we live in a difficult world, a lot of negative influences, and we pray that you'll help us to remain separated, that we'll live our lives as those who have been sanctified, and that we will be different than the world around about us. We pray, Father, you bless all the efforts to preach the truth this day and throughout the days ahead. And we pray, Father, that there may be many good hearts that will hear the gospel and be obedient to it. We pray, Father, that those things that are, that are false in nature might be defeated, that the truth might stand out. We pray, Father, that you bless us this day as we worship. Help us, help us to grow stronger. And we pray, Father, we'll all be like-minded, have the same focus and purpose in serving thee. And we pray that as you look down upon us and we stumble and fall, you forgive us of our sins and help us to find ways to become stronger. We pray, Father, that you'll bless our missionaries, bless all the efforts that we're engaged in here to promote the truth. We pray, Father, that you'll continue to bless us, help us to grow, and then one day own us and crown us in heaven. We pray in Christ's name. Amen. Last week we were talking about what had happened to Peter. And uh, to paint the picture those who might not have been here, the book of, of, of Acts chapter 12 is dealing with Herod persecuting the church and, and basically getting some pleasure out of that uh, to the extent that he planned to keep doing it. Uh, so he, he beheads, or he kills James, sorry, kills James with a sword. And then he um, uh, seeks to get Peter, puts Peter in prison, then Peter, Peter is released by an angel, and uh, goes to uh, a gathering at the, the house of Mary, who was the mother of John, John Mark. And uh, we see that uh, Peter comes to the house, and he shows himself and tells him what happened, uh, tells him to go and tell uh, James, that is the brother of Jesus, and the other brethren what's happened. And the idea there we talked about to, to promote the church and to show that God is in control and um, to help to, to bolster their, 
them as they are struggling with the persecution that's ongoing. Um, Peter seeks, uh, Herod seeks Peter, Peter moves on, and then Herod, of course, questions the guards, and because Peter has escaped, the guards are killed. Now, so we pick up in verse 19, and it uh, says that they put the, the, those to death that had uh, basically lost Peter because of what happened. And then it says he went down uh, from Judea to Caesarea and there uh, abode. And I said last week that this was Peter, and I misspoke. I went back and looked at it a little bit closer. Someone pointed out to me, and I appreciate that. Um, I went back and looked closer, and we're talking about Herod. So the verses that follow are the discussion of Herod. Um, we see that Herod is moving about his territory, as it were, um, as he is the king of the region, allowed to be that by the Roman government and certain responsibilities he has to govern such that there's no things that uh, Roman has to deal with, the Roman government has to deal with. It keeps things, it keeps the peace, it keeps things under control. And um, so we see the, the intent of Herod was trying to please the Jews that were there and, and trying to help stop this Christianity movement, uh, killing of James, and then trying to do the same thing with Peter. He's trying to please the people. And uh, that's what was said after Herod, when he saw, when Herod killed James, when he saw that it pleased the people, he pursued to take Peter. And so Peter's now gone, and uh, Herod is moving on. He's gone down from Judea to Caesarea, and there abode. Now, it's, it's interesting, if you look on the map, uh, we, we think from north to south, uh, Judea is, I believe I'm correct, that Judea is, is south of Caesarea. But Jerusalem was up uh, elevation-wise, and so you would go down um, to Caesarea. It's an interesting uh, concept, not one we really think about that much, but, but there, there he is, he finds himself. Now, it says that Herod was, was highly displeased with them of Tyre and Sidon. And, and there's no real uh, reason, understanding of the reason why this is the case. Um, there there's doesn't seem to be anything documented. Certainly nothing documented here, uh, nothing documented by, by Josephus. We're going to refer to Josephus a little bit more during this particular text this morning because he has some historical writings. Uh, are they accurate? I don't know, but I'll, I'll present those to you, and then you can do your own thinking about them. But um, uh, he, he doesn't have anything historically documented of why it would be that Tyre and Sidon were at odds or Herod would be displeased with them. Now what we want to say here is that there is a, um, a situation that Herod is, is dealing with uh, and, and by the way Herod being <laughs> somewhat like some people that are, are today who have a lot of wealth, they have houses all over the place. And they may have a lake house and they have a cabin in the mountains. They may have a regular house where they normally live. They may have one down by the beach or something. Um, Herod has another palace in Caesarea. And so as he goes from Judea to Caesarea, he's there abiding in another one of his palaces. Um, so we find him here, and the story is going to revolve a little bit about Tyre and Sidon and how they come to Herod um, on this particular occasion. Um, Tyre and Sidon, there was a Phoenician trade route, and Tyre and, si Tyre and Sidon were port cities, or coastal cities, uh, such that the trade route came through them. They were close together, and uh, a lot of the trade route would come through them. With Tyre and Sidon not being in good favor with Herod, and Herod ruling the, the area and kingdom of, around Caesarea, uh, there was concern in Caesarea also being a, uh, a city by the coast. There was concern that, that uh, the trade route could easily be changed by the king and say, okay, instead of having these major port cities of Tyre and Sidon, I want the trade route moved to Caesarea. Uh, and that would have taken 
you can imagine. Uh, it, we've got some great manufacturing facility in a small town, and, and that's where everybody works. And then something comes along or happens and say, well, we're going to move it. What does that do to that town? It's devastating. That's their income. That's their livelihood. So here we have a situation where the trade routes coming through Tyre and Sidon, Herod apparently, if displeased with them, could easily have changed it to Caesarea, and they feared that. And so as we read on, you'll see sort of that unfolding, why there might be some concern on the people of Tyre and Sidon. If, if Herod was just displeased with them, and so, okay, the, somebody doesn't like us, big deal, if nothing could happen. But given that the fact that they could take away their livelihood and he could move it to the south, then uh, th this was a big deal. And so it says here that he was, not dis dis he was not pleased with them or he was displeased with them. But they came uh, uh, with one accord, both cities of Tyre and Sidon, one accord, uh, to him. And having made already preparation for this, they had made Blastus, the king's chamberlain, uh, their friend, they'd gotten inside to the, to the uh, inner parts or the personnel that worked very closely. Now, the chamberlain was someone who would look after the quarters of the king. He would make sure that his bed was made or it was made prepared for him to, to sleep in or whatever he needed. So he was right in um, close proximity with Herod. He, he was the, an inside person. And so they had gotten an inside person and made friends with him and tried to get him to go in on their behalf uh, to Herod. So they made Blastus the king's chamberlain, their friend. They uh, desired uh, for they desired peace because their country was nourished by the king's country. And upon a set day, Herod arrayed in royal peril set upon his throne and made an oration unto them. So they come unto him as this crowd um, trying to, to have peace, wanting to make him happy in some way, and, and he gets ready to present himself unto them. Now, according to Josephus, Herod had put on some fabulous outfit. It was made of silver, and, and it was polished silver, to, I guess, the extent that they could do it in that time. And he parades himself before them with the sun shining. Well, you could imagine how that appears. He, he is just bright. He's shining in, the, in, in front of them. And so he, he's there to be seen, you know. Uh, and, and if you look behind the story here, and it's, it's hard for us to know everything that went on, but you could almost understand that there's something that's been portrayed to Herod. Hey, these people, they're a little concerned and... They, they've come to hear you speak. And, and so, you know, they're, they're there to hear you. They, they want to, to make peace. They want to be, uh, be in your presence. I don't know the population of Tyre and Sidon, but it says they, with one accord, it would indicate either they, in connection with one another, saying, hey, we need to help each other out, or it could have been that both cities sort of poured out to hear what Herod had to say. Uh, coming to him in peace. And it would appear that that would be the case because there was a great crowd or a crowd gathered here for Herod to speak to. Now you can imagine Herod coming out in this garment that's reflecting the sun and just shining, almost probably blinding some of the people uh, and making himself out to be something special. And that's, that's sort of how Josephus portrays it is, is the historical account is, is provided for us. So he, he goes out, he makes an oration unto him. And of course the people wanting Herod to be on their side and, and Herod not to, to be displeased with them and for them to be able to continue to, to do things that would promote their livelihood, they gave a shout and saying, it is the voice of a God and not of a man. Now, it's interesting, just a chapter or so ago, we see uh, Cornelius as he bows down to Peter as if Peter was... Uh, it, it, it appears quite different than when the angel came to him and says, hey, send for Peter over in Joppa. It doesn't, we don't get the impression that Cornelius uh, bowed down uh, in any way to the angel. Peter comes along as a, a, 
representative of God to preach the gospel, to tell him what he needs to hear. And Cornelius bows down to him. And Peter's response to that is, get up. I myself also am a man. Now here's Herod, who is this king who apparently likes to, to hear good things about himself, likes to be pumped up, likes for the people to think he's a great person, as it, we see the Jews early in the chapter. And now he, he's making himself to be some great person uh, to these people. And they're just lauding him and saying, oh, you're a god, you're a god. Herod does not respond to this in any way, shape, or form to say, no, hold off, you know, I'm just a, a man, I'm not God. He accepts all that praise and adoration that's given to him by the people. And because of that, we're going to see what happens. The people gave a great shout saying, it's the voice of a God and not of a man. And immediately, the angel of the Lord smote him, that is Herod, because, why? He gave not God the glory. And he was eating the worms and gave up the ghost. Now that is a quick and dirty of what happened. Now if we believe Josephus and the timing of what he uh, chronicles in his, his writings, um, Herod was smitten with worms those that would eat his flesh uh, on this occasion. And Josephus records that Herod lived five years. He died of exactly what was said here. He died of flesh eating worms, a horrible death. Um, it would have been one of those things that over time would have just been disgusting. You can imagine your, fl your flesh being eaten with worms and decaying and probably the, the stench that goes along with that. That would have been a horrible death. When you look at his writings of Scripture, there's no way for the writers to have written um, everything that went on. There's, there's just no way. I mean, And so what we have for us is written those things that we need to know. Now, the fact that Herod didn't give God the glory that he was smitten with words and died. That's the story. Now, the fact that whether when we say he was immediately stricken with worms and then we see a little bit later in the chapter he died, we, we jump to a conclusion that, hey, he was smitten with worms and he died immediately. If that were the case, then uh, the worms would have eaten his flesh in front of the people like some science fiction story, and he would have just like Raiders of the Lost Ark or something like that, he would have just melted in front of their eyes. And that, that doesn't seem to be plausible. And so what I'm saying is that although the verse says that he was immediately stricken and then he died, gives us the impression that it happened within a matter of a few minutes, then that does not necessarily the case. And Scripture doesn't say that. That's just what we sometimes jump to in conclusion when we read through it real quickly. And so uh, Josephus... Uh, I think has no reason to, to um, you know, taint the, the, the accuracy of his writings uh, in this regard. So I think that that's probably what happened. Um, but you can take that and, and think it over and see what, whatever you want to about that and maybe do some further research. But the idea here is that, that Herod, because of this, paid the consequences. And it says... Um, that verse 24, the word of God grew and multiplied. Now, the Greek word that is used in this particular phraseology, grew and multiplied, the Greek words mean that they, there was an exceedingly uh, great multiplication. I don't know exactly what that means. How do you know what that means? It just means the church really grew. It wasn't that the church just sort of you know, did okay, you know. It's not like, uh, you know, some people today feel good when they sort of just break even all the time. I'm doing pretty good. There are some people who are looking in, in business for a great growth, return on investment. And, and so they're looking for that real climb. Um, and so when you talk about growth, it, it conjures up different things in people's minds. But in this case, it says that they grew exceedingly. And it says, the, the Greek words give the impression that it was a great growth, 
uh, of the church. Now, we're going to transition now from some things that we have been seeing happen over several chapters into Paul and Barnabas. And we're going to see Paul's name changed here in the next chapter. And from that point on, he's going to be referred to as Paul. But we're going to see a transition. Now we're fixing to go from Peter being involved to Paul being involved. And Paul being the main character along with Barnabas and Silas and some others. But certainly Paul. But uh, I want to pause here and sort of drive a stake in the ground because I want to go back and reflect on some things. I want you to look at the, the early church. Um, the day of Pentecost, uh, growth of the church, the church is, is growing. Um, we see fairly soon after that uh, the idea of Stephen and Stephen being uh, stoned to death. We see Paul consenting to that, or Saul consenting to that. We see Saul making havoc of the church for several chapters. We see other persecutions that are going on. The church is growing. It is um, going from persecution uh, from the location of the church in Jerusalem, although the church in Jerusalem remains strong with the apostles staying there. Those that were being persecute, persecuted were scattered, but as they went, they preached the gospel. A number of things. We see James being uh, killed at first of this chapter. We see Peter being in prison. We see James and John, uh, James and Peter and John, being put in prison early on in, in Acts chapters three and four. Persecution that's ongoing. Uh, it's just uh, turmoil that they have to deal with. But this particular passage here uh, brings to bear, and, and I. I'm not sure how to say this, I'll just say it. God has told us that the church, from the prophecy of Daniel in chapter 2 and verse 44, that he will establish a kingdom that what? Never pass away. Never be destroyed. And I want you to somewhat get the the understanding of, of what's happening here, the significance of it. What, in our history, what has happened to uprisings in China in Tiananmen Square, for example? Have we seen the growth of that movement in China? Is China now on the verge of splitting or being changed as a nation because of that uprising? What would you say about that? Would you say that that internal revolution is alive and well? It may be. We don't know much about it. Those people were, were put to death. They were squelched. I want you to understand the, the power of God. I want you to understand the decision of God that's being made and, and you don't unless you do a little bit of study and, and thinking about it you don't understand or appreciate what's happened here in the first part of the book of Acts persecutions yes but persecutions that led to silencing of the, the, the gospel persecutions that led to people uh, not being children of God, not putting Christ in their lives and changing their lives. If you go back and look at what we studied and understand the significance, every time we see discussions about the persecutions of the church or someone being killed that's preaching the gospel, what do we have it usually followed up with? And they multiply greatly. Was Herod a powerful king? There's no question. There's no question the power of Herod. He was feared in this region. 
the people of Tyre and Sidon would just sort of say, Pih. you know, so what? Herod's upset. No big deal. He can't do anything. The lives of the people that Herod governed were these people understood that he could control the, whether or not they had good things happen or bad things happen. He was a powerful king. He was given free reign by the Roman government as long as he did not bring any shame or displeasure to the Roman government. He could do pretty much what he wanted to. I doubt that Herod got permission. Hey, ask the people in Rome, is it okay if I go ahead and take James and kill him? He didn't have to ask permission for that. If it pleased the Jews and the Jews were going to be happy and that's the major population that's there, Herod had the power. He's a powerful king. God will not allow anything. If you look at the early part and also the latter half of uh, Acts, but the early part of Acts, God was not going to allow anything to stand in way of the growth of the church. So I ask you, would God today stand in the way of the growth of the church? How would you answer that? God hasn't changed. Is God's intent that the word of God continue to be spread? I think the answer is yes. I don't think there's any question if you look at scripture. Is it God's intent that things would not stop the growth of the church? I think that he could say yes. He still is intent on these things happening. God's not going to work today in terms of special intervention like he did in their times for things to happen. We have a ruler that rises up and could speak and say, I'm really a God. I, you know, look at me. Then he's not going to be smitten with worms and uh, we see him all of a sudden just start spiraling down because of something that he said that's contrary to God. That's not how God operates today. But God's intent is that he will be supporting us in the propagation of the gospel. And if we'll believe that, and if we'll put the effort into trying to do that, we can see results. I think we as human beings have over time said, well, we just don't have the means we just don't we can't do these things and, and I'm I lean toward begging to differ it's a phenomenal thing and obviously we don't just talk about this a lot but it's a phenomenal thing to have the number of hits that we have that are looking at our website and pulling up sermons and other material that we are trying to put out there throughout the world. I think we had, over the last few months, somewhere in the neighborhood, and I'd have to get Rob to correct me, but I think we have had over 500 to 600 countries throughout the world that have hit our website. Now, some of them are saying, oops, that was a mistake, it didn't mean to go there. But there's a percentage that say, what is, what is this that people are putting out here? Let me look at it a little bit closer. And I think that we, we just limit ourselves sometimes because of our own fears and, and imposed constraints from preaching the gospel like we need to. And, and, I, and I challenge this group. I, I think the congregation here can do some marvelous things. And I think there are ways we can try to promote that. I'm not saying we all are going to be, become teachers or preachers or, or be really uh, change our personalities and be somebody that we're not all of a sudden. But what I'm saying, in every little way that you can support preaching the gospel in efforts that we try to make, 
if you'll support that, we'll, we're going to try to do some things. And, and I think we can do some marvelous things. God does not intend and did not allow in the time of Acts anything, kingdoms, kings, governmental powers, no one was going to stop the growth of the church. The church was going to come. God had said he had planned it before the foundations of the world. And these people were not, and that's the message. That's the message that you have to understand and read into the first few chapters of Acts. No one, but no one was going to stand in the way of the gospel and the kingdom being established and, and grow in this world. Now, Satan has done a tremendous job, not to tip my hat to him, but he's done a tremendous job through men coming in and trying to manipulate the gospel and change what the Word of God says to their own desires and has confused millions of people. Maybe it's even in the billions. I don't know how to even describe that because they twist and they rest the scriptures to their own destruction. But the word of God and the preaching of the gospel is going to be done. And I would say woe unto us if we're not part of that. The strong message here from God is that these incidences in history and th those who were involved in it have to see that God would not allow the church to be destroyed. And it's amazing if you go back and look at what's really happened. No matter what happened to the people, no matter how difficult it was, how many of us, if we had our parents uh, taken from us right out of our houses by the authorities and put to death because of believing in Jesus Christ would have probably grown up promoting the gospel of Christ. I don't know. I, I, I think that would be a deterrent. But yet these people didn't let it stop them. Wherever they went, the church grew. They did not stop what they were doing. The, there was no way that anybody in force could stop what was going on. God would not allow it. And Herod with his might and power stood before the people and being lifted up as some God. And what he was doing, that's the point I'm trying to make. It's not just a matter of what Herod was doing at this point, receiving the praise of the people, but what had Herod started down the path to do at the first of the chapter? To stamp out Christianity, to please the, the Judaizing Jews, to say this Christ is not going to be in my kingdom. And God would not allow Herod to continue. And there's some amazing things happening there, and I think you just need to go through and comb through those first few chapters of Acts and understand the message that the church was here to stay and that God would do what he needed to do to make that happen. Herod's in the way. Herod's no more. And so these are some things that are pretty impressive if you look at what's happening. In most cases, and the reason I made the China incident is because in most cases, uprisings that are, are squashed by the government either go underground where you don't hear anything about them or they are totally stopped. But not Christianity. And so now we transition to see where uh, Barnabas and Saul return from, from Jerusalem. Um, now, why had they gone to Jerusalem? What, had the, what was the prophecy about? There was going to be what? Famine. And uh, so they, the people, in, the brethren in Jerusalem were in dire need. 
And so Paul and, and Barnabas, Saul and Barnabas, were at Antioch uh, in Syria, and they said, hey, let's send some relief to them. And so they, they took it down. So they had gone to Jerusalem, and when they had fulfilled their ministry, that is of providing what they had taken down to the brethren at Jerusalem, uh, then they they'd go back to Antioch. And uh, they, they took with them when they went uh, John, whose surname was Mark. Now, John Mark is mentioned early in the chapter. He, his mother was Mary. And uh, we, we see here that, uh, and we see later that uh, in the chapter 13 that, that John Mark and Barnabas are related. And so they take him with them, and they go back to Antioch. Now there were in the church that was at Antioch certain prophets and teachers as Barnabas and Simeon that was called Niger and Lucius of Cyrene and Maenon which had been brought up with uh, uh, Herod the Tetrarch. Um, and they ministered to the Lord and they fasted and the Holy Ghost said separate me Barnabas and Saul for the work wherein I have called them. I have a special calling for Barnabas and Saul. And uh, we need to get them prepared to do that. They have a mission. They have a purpose that's specific to them. And when they had <laughs> fasted and prayed, <coughs> they laid their hands on them. They sent them away. Uh, not laying hands on them from the perspective of providing to them some spiritual gifts. We know that certainly that Saul already had that ability. But the idea of blessing them and, and sending them out under their, um, their watchful eye and, and uh, their, their blessings and their, uh, their support. So they being sent forth by the Holy Ghost departed into Seleucia, and from thence they sailed to Cyprus. So we're already seeing uh, the idea of the missionary journeys are going to start. Uh, the Holy Ghost is directing them to go. They have a specific purpose, and uh, we're going to see that play out here in just the next few verses. But um, the, they, they go. And not only do they go, but they travel to get to Cyprus to travel by boat. Um, and, 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 and Paul certainly, Barnabas and Silas, um, Timothy, others, that were all parts of those missionary journeys were, uh, were travelers. They traveled. And they hit the roads to do what they needed to with the gospel. And when they were at Salamis, they preached the word of God in the synagogues of the Jews. Now that's a recurring theme that we see here. They would go to the synagogues, they would discuss with them certain things that apparently in the synagogues of those times there was a lot of discussion about spiritual things, about biblical things, about the writings of the scripture and they would discuss those things and they just, and, and sometimes you might consider more of an arguments, legal discussions or arguments that are put forth but this was a place where the Jews were going to be gathered and an ideal opportunity to go talk to them about their background, their history. And you're going to see here as we get into chapter 13 is exactly what, what Saul or Paul does. And I'm glad we can go to this chapter and start calling him Paul because you try to be accurate when you teach and not call him Paul prior to this time. But it's hard to do, isn't it? When, when he's so active and writes so many letters and, and when you refer to him from all those writings as Paul refer to him as Saul which by the way always to me carries with it a, an understanding of the old man involved in persecuting the church as opposed to Paul who I always think of as not but that's just <clears throat> something you have to deal with so they started in the synagogues and they had also John to their minister or as their attendant and when they had gone through the uh, aisle into Pap uh, Paphos they found a certain sorcerer, a false prophet, a Jew, whose name was Bar-Jesus. So they run across a person. He's a Jew. But what kind of Jew is he? He is a Jew that is a false prophet. Now, 
I, I don't know how to take that if you take it from the perspective that what he prophesied about was false or didn't happen or was, was fake, didn't ever come to pass. That's one way we could take, about, take a look at it. Or we could also look at it from the standpoint that, that he prophesies, but he prophesies things that are um, not appropriate or contrary to the word of God. Uh, so, however we look at him as a false prophet, what he had to pro- prophesy about was not appropriate, was not something that was healthy and uh, meaningful. Um, he was with the deputy of the country, and that deputy was Sergius Paulus. And Sergius Paulus was a prudent man. Um, that was a man who, who thought through things. He, he used his wisdom. Um, <clears throat> he tried to evaluate things. Uh, he called for, this Sergius Paulus called for Barnabas and Saul and desired to hear the word of God. I, I've heard there's something going on, this, this gospel people keep talking about. I'd like to hear what that's about. So he calls for them, asks to hear about that. But Elamus, the sorcerer, and so we say, well, are there two sorcerers here? There was one uh, <clears throat> that uh, is talked about in verse 6, being bar Jesus. And then there's this Elamus, who was a sorcerer in verse 8. But look at the par- parenthetical statement. For, for so is his name by interpretation. We're talking about the same person. bar Jesus. Elamus, same person. <clears throat> he withstands them. <clears throat> now, here's one way that this person could have been a false prophet. Just trying to prevent the gospel, which is the truth for people to, to hear and understand. He could have been a false prophet from the standpoint that he, or at least how he used his uh, position or ability to try to keep people from hearing the gospel. So he he, he confronts them, and he's, he wants them to uh, try to turn the deputy away from the faith. He didn't want him to hear it. Then Saul, which is also called Paul, filled with the Holy Ghost, set his eyes on him. Now, I don't know what that, what that means. And uh, you hear so many different things about, about Paul. Not a man of great stra- statue, not a man of great uh, speaking ability. But it seems like Paul has a tenacity about him. And to set your eyes on somebody um, sort of likens me to uh, a mother having to issue a command to a child um, in the form of maybe a request. And then that child just ignoring that. You've had your mom turn her eyes on you and look you right straight square in the face. You sort of melt a little bit, don't you? Okay, I know I haven't done right. Now she's fixing to really get on me. I don't know what, uh, what that means exactly, but could have just been he turned to him and looked at him and said, hey, look, but you wonder about that. So Paul set his eyes on him and said, O oh, full of all subtlety and all mischief, thou child of the devil, thou enemy of all righteousness, Will thou not cease to pervert the right ways of the Lord? And now, behold, the hand of the Lord is upon thee, and thou shalt be blind, not seeing the sun for a season. And immediately there fell on him a mist and a darkness, and he went about seeking some to lead him by the hand. Now you can imagine the the drastic change here. From just the personality that's, exhibited here in the few verses that we've read so far this was a man who was apparently in charge of things he jumped in to make things happen he jumped in to block the truth being presented to Sergius Paulus he probably acted like this most of the time hey I'm in charge here I'm going to make the decisions now all of a sudden here's a man who can't find his way around has to be led because of what Paul's done and so he has to be um, led by the hand. Then the deputy, when he saw what was done, believed. Now, this passage could be a little bit troubling. 
Let's read what it says. Then the deputy, when he saw what was done, believed, being astonished at the doctrine or teachings of the Lord. That passage helps us to understand a little bit more. There are people who, who have seen things or sometimes they think they've seen things. Oh, I believe. Uh, and so from this particular passage, what I gather from it is the fact that he saw the power of God, probably had not seen anything like that at this point. We're not around Jerusalem. These are not... Um, they're, they're in, in locations now where people haven't seen what's been going on. They haven't seen the kind of things that have happened in and around Jerusalem, Samaria. Um, these people are now in almost like a different country because they're not close to where things have been happening. He's seeing something for the first time. What he's seeing is that Paul is real, and what Paul has is real. This passage is not saying that because of what happened to Elamus that Sergius Paulus believed and obeyed. Notice what it says. He believed, but what did he believe in? He was astonished at what happened to, to Elamus. That's not what the passage says. He was astonished at the doctrine or teachings of the Lord. Now, I don't know what had happened there, and here again, we don't understand the timing. We don't understand the timing. This one verse makes it sound like bam, bam, that uh, Elamus was struck blind, surgery positive, believed all of a sudden. And so we need to be careful with that. He wasn't converted because of what happened to, to Elamus. He was converted by the teachings of the gospel. So we'll pick up here uh, next week and continue on.